In this video we're going to start looking at what happens when matter flows between two phases and use that to define the quantity called the chemical potential. Okay, so let's start by assuming we have two phases. They're in equilibrium with each other and being in equilibrium means that the change in your Gibbs energy during that process is going to be zero. It's the definition of equilibrium. So the total Gibbs energy, if we assume say we have a solid and a liquid phase, the total Gibbs energy is going to be the Gibbs energy of the solid plus the Gibbs energy of the liquid. Okay, so if we have some change in that Gibbs energy, dg, that would be equal to the partial derivative of the solid Gibbs energy with respect to the number of particles in the solid, ns, and this would be at constant pressure and temperature. Remember, Gibbs energy is a pressure is a function of pressure and temperature, so we're keeping those two constant. So the Gibbs energy is otherwise going to stay constant, except for exchanging particles. And then, so it's this partial derivative times the change in the number of particles in the solid, d n s, number of particles in the solid, plus partial derivative of the Gibbs energy of the liquid with respect to number of particles in the liquid. Again, constant pressure and temperature times the change in the number of particles in the liquid. Okay, so as the particles flow back and forth between the solid and the liquid, this will be how the Gibbs energy will change. If we're going to hold the number of particles constant, then it's going to be true that the change in the number of particles of the solid is going to be the negative of the change of the number of particles in the liquid. For every, par for every particle that the solid gains or loses, the liquid must lose or gain a corresponding particle. We, can't, we cannot create particles out of nowhere. That would violate the first law of thermodynamics. That, if you want particles to be created, go take, a, go take a physics course on particle physics or something. This is chemistry. All of our particles are going to exist forever. Okay, so given that fact, we can substitute in DNS for uh, or minus dns for dnl here, then the change in our Gibbs energy, dg, is going to be our partial derivatives again, gs dns constant pt minus dgl dnl constant p and t, and then this will be dns this will be minus dns, so we factored out the change in the number of particles in the solid there, substituting in that minus sign. Now we can define a quantity which makes this easier to write and will be a very useful quantity for us. And that quantity is going to be the chemical potential mu. So mu is called the chemical potential. and mu of a given phase, alpha, be that solid, liquid, gas, etc., is going to be equal to the partial derivative of the change of the Gibbs energy of that phase with respect to the change in the number of particles in that phase at constant pressure and temperature. So mu for a given phase is going to be a function of temperature and pressure. Okay, so we've defined this chemical potential here as being this derivative with respect to number of particles of this Gibbs energy. So we can rewrite this expression on the next page as dg, our change in our Gibbs energy equals mu s, chemical potential of the solid, minus mu l, chemical potential of the liquid, times the change in the number of particles in the solid DNS. And this is again assuming constant pressure and temperature for these chemical potentials. So we know because this is in equilibrium with each other that our dg equals zero because we're in equilibrium. And if particles are flowing back and forth between the two phases as occurs during melting and as occurs during freezing, we know that the change in the number of particles is not equal to zero. 
So in order for this equation to be satisfied, for this to be equal to zero, there's only two possibilities. You can either have the change in the number of particles equals zero, or you can have mu s equal mu l, such that this term in parentheses is zero. And that is going to, in fact, be the case that when you're in equilibrium between solid and liquid, for example, you'll have the chemical potential of those phases equals one another. Mu s equals mu l when they are in equilibrium. Any two, any phases which are in equilibrium with one another have to have equal chemical potentials. You can think of a chemical potential as kind of the energy which the particle wants to roll downhill, just like a ball wants to roll downhill, it wants to lower its gravitational potential. A particular particle wants to lower its chemical potential, so if it can change phases and lower its chemical potential, it will do so. Electricity flows from high to low potential, objects flow from high to low potential, and particles will flow from high to low chemical potential. If you have a single phase, so let's say we don't have multiple phases, we're just interested in a single phase, then the chemical potential becomes a very familiar quantity that we know. So mu for a single phase would just be equal to the Gibbs energy divided by the number of particles, which would just be the molar Gibbs energy, which is equal to the partial derivative of the Gibbs energy with respect to number of particles at constant temperature and pressure. So mu for a single phase is just equal to the molar Gibbs energy, but it becomes more complicated when we have multiple phases because it is just whatever the derivative of the Gibbs energy of that phase is with respect to the number of particles it has. So chemical potential is going to have many uses for us in uh, this and future chapters and topics, uh, particularly in topics such as solutions. And we're going to see that it's going to be useful telling us which way the particles want to flow uh, between various systems.